Welcome to Wickerson Studios. I am going to record my first session late, probably a half an hour into it, just because I have to get a feel of what I'm going to do here. And I'm going to record these until we find an audience that kind of can guess at what I'm doing. I'm not teaching uh, my course material at the school at work, and I am not teaching the content for the MGSM uh, challenge. What I've decided for this series to draw people in on Friday mornings, which would be Friday afternoon if you're based out of Cairo, um, is I'm going to revisit my very first scripts. And my intention today is to basically uh, record for possibly a half an hour uh, first six to eight scripts that I ended up making and why I made them. So I'm going to put them into a full, uh, this, is, this is probably a way to come at uh, Rhino or learn writing, but it's also a way to learn Grasshopper. And if anybody knows me from a year making videos, I've been working on Grasshopper and Rhino for since about January 2000, about 2019. So I haven't been that long, about two and a half years. And this would be one of the scripts that I first started. Now I, I fixed it up a little bit and added some elements that you can find in Rhino 7, which weren't available at the time. And the session is being recorded, so just enjoy it. When you come to one of my scripts, or you find it within GitHub, I will have it as a open source repository, along with these videos on YouTube, summarizing. Uh, let's take a look at what's actually happening here, and a quick overview, so I hope to do about you know, five to six minutes on each one, see if we can get through a half dozen, I hope you find it interesting. So what I do when I get to a script is I immediately ungroup it, and I put it on geometry that's being selected, so if nothing's been selected, you're not seeing anything. But I'm trying to make this brush simulation. When you come to one, you might want to understand why number sliders are such a wonderful parametric tool. Just come in and slide around the number sliders to see what this model can actually do. Find a few of them. You see that's the diameter. It may be a slow moving script um, as I change this, but it seems to be moving pretty fast. Uh, I do have a little uh, multi-dimensional slider here. One thing you'll notice on these scripts is I do have the plug-in to bifocals. If you're curious on how to bring in bifocals, you want to go to Food for Rhino, check out your special port folders, your user objects, and be able to import into, uh, maybe not user objects, but certainly in your libraries, um, the plugins that you like using the most. So I'm just going to put that one in like that. And Keep sliding through to see if there's any additional sliders to play with. There's one just for scaling off of a point. I think this is one that makes the dance, actually gets this to kind of mimic a kind of brush simulation. And every number slider you can go in, you can animate. I'm going to throw it through 120 animations so you can see how that kind of just produces a bunch of uh, bitmaps or JPEGs off of another file for future reference if I wanted to do something. So let's take a look at the script. Um, we're, let's say, about one minute in, even though I know we're more than that, we're about three minutes in. And I have a kind of index loop here that keeps going in and again. Keep in mind, this was my first script. And even though the Evaluate Surface is not an old script, I could update it. I think I'll leave it just for a good memory. How I usually build things are with point systems and point grids. So what I did was I simply went in and used the range of numbers that will produce a point grid in the X direction. And at any time you want to know what's going on in the scripts, have yourself a panel tool to take a look at the content. And for those that really want to get the mind of the grasshopper, you're going to want to have a uh, brand viewer as well. Uh, taking a look at what that data is, what's going on one branch with nine items. Keep sliding that along. You'll see that I produced a surface for points, which is a nice node in the surface. I divided that surface into an isotrope. It's a very small, tight little algorithm that most people use. And it's very popular, and I was using it right from the start. Actually, I think it's so popular, we will make it um, kind of a go green. Um, so take a look at that one. And for those that don't have the same setup as me, make sure you're in displays, you're drawing your icons, you're drawing fancy letters, you're drawing full names. We kind of relate to one another. What I do with that surface after I've isotrained it, divide it by a U and B count, which is U lines in one direction. Out the other, you'll see my wires are actually making it so the script stays. And I had to do a little correction because when I first started, I wasn't thinking that way. I found this multi dimensional slider which relates to any area within those grids. So if you take a look at the shift those grids and then see where these planes are moving, you can see how they move around. 
graphics. And here's the place that you think of you going to this display and take the preview planes and bring those down to point three in scale, which will stay for all of the files. And you can see that, that those grids, with these items, now I'm able to move those planes around on that surface, which just gives a little bit of finesse. I move it up very high. Uh, in Z direction 16, it doesn't have to be that long a brush. And I produce a scale geometry that takes this geometry and even moves it farther away. And I'm not sure why I did that, but I did to produce, oh, an arc C, which allowed me to use an index number after this was flattened to produce this arc. And this becomes the bending arc on the bend of form that slows down the strip to 62 milliseconds. So I have a geometry that I'm actually able to build lines between the first bits of data, which I actually have to use the flip matrix tool to match my data structures as 81 items and 81 items. And this is a great time to go ahead and hit the cold war panel viewer over here because you're starting to do a little data manipulation. You want to make sure that this data in here, one item with 81 branches, matches the same. Um, structure is this one. That way I can pair up those lines really nicely. I put multiple lines, do a bend the form on each one, type each one, and now I'm able to run through a simulation and see that I'm animating it. So I'll cut it down to 20 so we can really watch it all and see how that simulation works as a brush. And that's what I mean. So that one's done after six minutes. Let's see if we can go on and open up another one. I'm going to take a look at uh, brush simulation, a dock simulation, which was my concept of building a dock. And you see, I changed it a bit. And ever since I built this one, I thought, well, this simulation might look a little better as a chair. Don't ask me why, but I was playing around with it. It's a little longer, and I was a little param heavy at the beginning of this strip. So as you go in and see this section, I, I've uncolored. I should give it to you fully colored. Let's take a group. Let's make this kind of build green play with it, and that will be saved. And then these frames, you can go in and see what happens as you start to slide them. That's producing quite a bit of slats on this um, kind of dock. This one's it's mirrored in the end, so it slows down a bit. I've got some height that I can play with on the, on the slats of wood. I can lengthen, actually I can jitter and move this kind of side curve that's undulating that old dock. And I can make this really flash of this strange kind of uh, reverse engineered uh, creature or butterfly or machine. And I'm also able to manipulate it on XYZ, which is really where I think I'm playing with. Here's, a, here's an amplification again on dividing the points and moving it around related to a little bit of trigonometry. There's a little bit of radii on the pipes that I did. There's probably blanks to those pipes because later I had to do a Boolean union through a base. I wasn't thinking very clear code. You can see the number count here. Some are integers, some are floats. Uh, mostly they relate to dimensions in the sense that it came from a world of kind of building and moving things. So as I built things in a wood and timber, you'll see that in another sketch. This one seems to do a little bit. Um, I'm able to kind of play with those. Now, what I'd like to do is cut this back a bit on the domain really far and actually think of this in its very low form of domain. So I'm going to take this back down to a 10 count as a param. We're going to make it a rational number. I'm going to really bring it in even with this one. There's a little bit of manipulation as well. Those are numbers. I'm going to zoom in here and kind of consider this as a kind of strange little awkward chair. It has multiple legs. They behave at different rates, but I'm able to kind of see it. And sometimes you can go to zoom select, but sometimes you have to leave. And here you go. You can build a little bit of geometry that might have started as a deck or a chair, so we might have somebody here. Um, just uh, where I make a jog out. A welcome if you're here. I thought I had a picture going. I had to go up here. I am recording uh, this video because I don't have, oh, reconnect. Uh, that's what's happening. Reconnect. Um, let's see if I'm there. Let's go back into the screen. Maybe I had a time limit. Let's go back to the live video. And I will click this back down like this and click this one off to the side. So that was a little bit of a break in what I was doing. Let's just slide this one off 
here. So keep going. Um, so this one actually is, if we take a look at the point system that's been created, or we take a look at that, right, was always attached with kind of this amplification of a range. So I took a range through an x coordinate and I multiplied it not only by cosine of that in the z direction, <coughs> I multiplied it by sine and cosine multiplied together to get the strange curve. And I usually think of interpolating curves to drive data, dividing the points on that curve, moving that curve in one direction and the other direction, and then I put horizontal frames within this. It actually just shows up one single horizontal frame scaled to that. And you can see it's a little jumbly. I put circles on this one to get the bases moved down so I can loft between them to have these pipe legs. I continued with the scale interpretation, another interpolating curve so I can get these lines between it. This probably came from my early Tinkercad models of building a sine wheelbarrow I was kind of obsessing with. And you can see the other points here and the circles within that side. So not a very good mirrored or data-driven object. There are some problems, and I'm extruding these in a pretty simple fashion, extrude and then extrude again. And I think it's because I was thinking extremely geometrically and building something. So you still have the other loft. You can see how this ended up becoming one form. The cap holes, the legs become this, the cap pipes become this, and the cap the other edge becomes this. And I joined the preps and end up with something very strange in this direction. And I can always go back to this tool. What's nice is you can select one and follow this back via radii. Because after cleaning up, things can get kind of ugly um, uh, with the frames all off to one side. You're not seeing what you're doing. I carry it through with a breath joint to see if you can actually function that. We slow down the 7 milliseconds, which isn't bad. And I move those up for some reason to make a Boolean unit. You can see how awkward this is. And I do the solid difference with this extrusion of this box, which I actually miss it. Um, because in the corner, I mean, it just basically extrudes and flatten those legs. You can see these ones are a little high. I was kind of thinking of the water level when I was doing that. I mirror it and I grab both sides with a, with a uh, merge tool. And then I'm able to build this kind of strange geometry that went from being a dock and being this kind of awkward uh, chair. And possibly, if you look at the script, I'd have to consider like, what is happening? Why am I actually this out and producing this form? Uh, but that's like one of the second, that's like the second script that I ended up inventing uh, and playing with. So, what I'll do is I'll grab that. Group, take that over to a color and show you that that was like one of those early scripts. Let's continue because we're at 12 minutes, so it'll be about six minutes of video. I'm trying to get through this in about a half an hour. Uh, I will open up another one. Uh, sometimes get a little more interesting. I think I end with one that's fairly nice. This was one that I made for my kids, and I thought, well, let's make toys. Let's actually go in and make it so they can bake objects as they go. So here's kind of the pipes. Here's some struts. Here's a kind of a bottom of the spaceship flanging out to this roof, uh, making a capsule for somebody to be in a little roof umbrella and this kind of parasol that's awkward around it. But if you take a look at this, all these objects in their final form, and then parametric control, I literally was asking my kids to play with this. So. Let's change the count and see where it kind of flips out. At times, they can bake whatever model they work. They have a little bit of control of rotating like it's a toy. Some of these values really turn things inside out on themselves and change the scale. And I'm starting to work parametrically with similar number sliders. You can see the real effect of that. And then as I move it through here, you can see how that starts to take on different designs as well. So why produce one iteration when you can write the script to produce several iterations? People can kind of customize their own uh, mass customization for what they're doing. This actually isn't a bad script. If you consider it's like my third script, I'm thinking, what is the possibilities of this? Why did you use something like this? A lot of people ask me, like, why, why did you make it? Did you know you were going to make that when you started? Absolutely not. And I don't really know what I'm going to make when I start. If it's not a commission and I haven't been asked to do something, and I'm very playfully approaching, say, it's stone carving, working plaster, or wax, or metal casting, this is the technique I take. So that one's pretty fast. We don't have to go over that. Maybe maybe a break time. It's extremely geometric, using planes and rotations and some transformations, finding center, interpolating more uh, horizontal or perpendicular flames, frames, uh, driving things by endpoints and vectors, uh, continuing to do the same system again and again, and flying through that is 
you know, dispatching information was always one of my first kind of set nodes that I like to use and list, get a hold of things. I wasn't really in the need for the picking place. I kind of understood dispatch as to what to do with it, rotating geometries and ending up with points. And then I really understood separately what I was looking for. And some of these things, obviously, doing multiple pipe, uh, I wasn't understanding that I could just plug in multiple uh, lists. I'm still working in single items, but here I am working in lists, but not wrapping my head around that. It's certainly falling short on what data uh, analysis requires when going into tree structures and lists and lists and lists and lists. So we'll group this, and like I said, we'll find something we can kind of enjoy. Uh, jump into here and grab that file, make that Kelly the like it, move on to the next one. So that was a little quick, like three minutes. I think that's how I'm going to get through this. So that was kind of the doc. That was the February 9th revisited. This is a cupola design, very simple but cumbersome in how I scripted it. So if we take a look at this, all the point and attributes to it, I'm really turning out these two objects, um, but I want to be able to see what I'm clicking as I go through. So in doing so, you're clicking what you want, something that's nice and thick profile and could be off. Uh, if I wanted to see the final forms here, uh, there they are. And then once again, I kind of set up parameters uh, to play with to see how that changes the form. And obviously, things are touchy, they're not working very engineered, like things are running against one another. Possibly good for a 3D print to analyze what you're doing. But if you know me, I kind of like Google cards. And I thought very mechanical when you're talking Grasshopper. And these are simple, and I think multiplicity is where things really take off. And asymmetry is where your models start to become interesting to others. So they really push that. I've learned that by some of the greats that taught at my school. Um, Richard Max is one of them that pushed me in the direction. So let's take a look. We've got a curve that's basically there, uh, which is the rounds. And we put uh, divided points within that. We found the center, so we have these points to play with. Uh, drawing a line between them will obviously be the uh, hub or the center up in radii of the wheel and the spokes, uh, moving that in one direction, joining the curves is something we did earlier, uh, finding center again, building a point system that's maybe off the page right now. I'm curious to where my point system is going. There it is, right at the zero line, moving that up and building probably somewhat of, uh, I was using some offsets, which is interesting. I started to understand evaluating curves along the parameter T to know where it is. So it's nice to think that I can go back in change that parameter from the start all the way around it if I've reparametized my curve and that's where I've started to understand the importance of reparametizing things uh, and I did with this little symbol here uh, closing the curves finding a list item putting it through a vector to any one of those points to drive things and then doing a mirror on one side and the other ends up with all of these geometries to produce this form so that's a roundabout way of doing that but ending up in a model that I think can be somewhat playful with very simple design to play with, uh, get you thinking, get you started, nothing fancy at all. There's no real maths in there besides the circle. And uh, I think that one we can fly over uh, pretty quickly as well. So let's throw that into a group. And I'll throw that into a nice color and say we're kind of done with that one. Sometimes I'll leave my params hanging over the sides so people probably can play with them. Whenever I have a param that I don't want people to play with or I want to hard code, I have a habit of double clicking the quote and saying, okay, that one. Well, but that's gonna that's gonna fudge it up a little bit if I do that because if I've left the parametric on one level and not on another, it may end up causing problems. So, uh, simple model, not really worth dwelling on too much. That's the cupola. Of February fourth, I guess I went into something a little more complex, and this one's a little disorganized still. I thought I reorganized it, but maybe I didn't save it. This model's a little slow. It's kind of playing off of a structure. And I was thinking a little more pattern-based, trying to understand my data. So when I grabbed a plane surface, once again, I did the surface through a uh, uh, ISO curve. And I did an ISO trim before, but this time I did an ISO curve that I could actually get access to the data here through a multi-dimensional slider. So I'm taking my parametric understanding or my, uh, of my, uh, what's it called? Well, just the parameter on a curve as T. Now I can start to give it as U and V and generating these different forms. Dividing those curves in different directions and making these very interesting grids. This is prior to understanding masks and offsets and path mapper. But I was able to move that data and I realized I really am driving my data 
that I wear and it's dark finished piece of material. And you'll see the interpolated lines that come from it. It's a pretty fast moving, slick strip that's controlled by multi dimensional sliders. And the reason that one's working so nicely to design this is I think I took off the end of the preface. The breath is working fast. But even the pipe and the spheres are working well. So I can go here and get this nice little model that I can study from and I don't have to physically get a bunch of pipe cleaners and hot calls and fabricate this. So I actually like this strip. I think it's fairly playful. It's a little jumbly. Probably I was intending to curve and a curve to build a surface that's lofted. And I have to wonder. I'm just going to put this in there because I didn't double check it. But if I put a curve in, say something like that, I put in another curve like that, and I take one of these curves, and I give a little rotation, I give another one a little rotation, I grab a loft between them, loft, I'm just doing a little bit, which I don't normally do. Uh, if we take that item and we grab a param a container, keep in mind it's a container, uh, of a surface, we might be able to um, add one surface to that and see what happens when I plug that in. Does it does it does it rot or is it a plane issue? So I have to I have to wonder if I've actually formed it, and I have. So wonderful that I could actually now go back and say, listen, I don't need that surface. I can take that curve and plug it into here. And do a set one curve. This is the power grasshopper. Take this one. And set one curve, and then I can put it in mine. So these are being driven, and what I would suggest is internalizing. Uh, even though they, well, I'll leave them ex externalized for now. Let's go into surface, loft, and do a little a shift to connect both. Should end up with a pretty, well, as long as we're connecting the right part, shift to connect the curves. We have a surface we can bring in, and now we have a parametric surface that's driving this data and behaving differently with these and we're getting up. Pretty cool structure that now, as I go in and update uh, maybe control points on this one, and we'll just play with that, it should be able to kind of like recorded history update my whole form. So that's a much more exciting script, and I think I'll just file save that once to watch this video that you kind of get it and understand what's happening. When you're done a script and you're playing around like this, you definitely want to, and because my uh, if anything's hard coded in like these curves. Um, they've been brought in the grass eyebrows, what I call ghosted forms. I would internalize those and I would internalize this. And now I don't require that data. And if I ever want to go back to it, I can bake that out and have it back in a Rhino if I want to play with it by control points in Rhino. If not, I'm just cleaning up my script and take a little bit of time for output. The only thing that's on display is the final one. But you can always have zoom select so you can see every geometry that's in there if it's not if it's on uh if it's not taken away from preview but i think i'll take preview off everything so then when i'm off i can either select every, uh, the final one that's been selected to go on or i can have everything and then have to select to see everything so a lot of geometry driving that but you start to see your algorithm and see what's happening so you know, in the end it's kind of interesting I, I kind of organize these. There's one. There'll be a line. I do like to see my parametric. Uh, I do like to see my uh, uh, lines, and I do like to see the names of my nodes. And I do like to see initially teaching uh, the names extended, even if you're very good at the icons. So the two moves, you can see how I'm thinking systematically. Maybe not the slickest code in the world. Uh, vectors, I obviously can read with those vector Z, because that kind of says vector C to me. And you, you kind of wean yourself off uh, icons as you go. We can leave those down at the base. Uh, containers are nice. Uh, the reason I have this container is so I can kind of sidetrack to this container, but always have this initial one. So you can, you can always like take something that's kind of simple and group it and just leave it there. Or maybe purple as a default, but that could be plugged into there. And then I've got some brands here that are worth playing with. And that's pretty understandable. And I have my curves, which I could completely build and make parametrically my models and points. And how I write scripts is I start even by understanding them. I go to the end and I walk backwards to see them. So if I can walk farther back upstream in the script and generate these curves parametrically, I definitely will. And you'll see me do that quite often. So actually, I think that's a pretty good little lecture uh, of what's happening. Let's take this one and uh, group it. Once again, once you've got figured things out, 
I really like the suggestion of understanding and playing with putting it in something and organizing it. But if you're comfortable with it, we'll hit save. And uh, I think it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, nice little study that shows you can go from planar to non planar, and that's usually a sign of a good script. That you want to probably tighten it up. What's great about this is if you knew you just needed two curves, you can take this whole thing and throw it into. Um, I think it was there, actually, I saw it. We don't usually do this uh, cluster. So then you're kind of understanding two curves will generate this, this nice little algorithm. You start nestling your stuff into what, you know, could be decided this little more efficient script, smaller, and you have less of a hand in what happens and get rid of a few of the parameters. But at least you can go in and make those curves experiment. I'm not going to do that for the series. I'm going to save it so it's open and I'm not going to make it so you have to jump in clusters to see content. I certainly don't like to make the habit of put a password on it because then all of a sudden it's gone. Um, I think we're still recording. At least I believe so. Uh, let's hit save and let's take a look at, that was February 4th. Let's take a look at open file February 4th. Uh, I thought we were in order. Uh, now it's up at the top because I've revisited it. Okay, we need to do it February 8th. Let's take a look at that one. Uh, so the recovery on that one and this one may be fairly simple and there it is couldn't be much more simple uh, nice little script to get people started uh, I might tuck the parameters into something else by selecting them but you see how you select everything when you do that so it's really good to ungroup organize uh, maybe make those params in your own group uh, different color uh, and I really do like kind of initiating people to kind of go for green Caution, yellow, and red might be a problem, but building a building a polygon that has many segments and bring that right down. Uh, understanding dividing the points, dividing the segments, uh, putting lines between them, uh, having a little bit of parametric control to slide around the weave to undulate in and out from those forms and rotate them, putting a polyline between them all. That gives you a little bit of the design finesse that you might want. And then I literally threw them through a linear array and a linear array again. I should have put out a box array, but since that was new to me, I tried to join them, but they're not touching, so it's irrelevant. And I can extrude them, and I can cap holes. And then you can take those to bake and have your little pumpkin feathers. Not a tough script. I'll leave that one. That's pretty 101 for people that are getting a start. And we will go to group and take that and color to do it here. And there we go. I think we're making a nice video series. And sometimes I take out all the other ones, preview off. So when I click here, I can see geometry and terrain. I'm selecting. And then I can only, of course, select one that's more suitable. And sometimes I like going in here because I really don't like the green and red. I'm just a much more uh, passive blue type person or jumping blue. It makes me feel a little better for the preference. Okay, so we'll save that one. And then we'll go in and we'll open up another. We're about 28 minutes. There's spring, which was interesting. There's an animation. I think I'll end with spring and animation. Uh, spring is uh, pretty. Actually, this is the animation. This is maybe the one I'll end with. The other one's a spring. It has a lot of math. This is one that I brought in, and I wanted to show. Like I initially worked with the idea of this being a box, and that is a box that I thought about and populated by points. Used the board only because everybody loves the board on the start and made a slider that I can blow it off in its normal directions. And it made sense that it works for that one. There's actually a couple of pieces missing that's almost like it's called out in the board and like it's solved. So I think it I think I have a pretty good piece of geometry to start. Um, and I literally have a few faults that just are having a little trouble. This one um, has not been flipped. So I've got a little bit that's going on, but you can see that I grabbed the chunks. And so these chunks, these are surfaces, 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 surfaces. But the whole thing runs as it pulls those together into a really nice explosion. I'll just leave the script for people to figure out. The power of this script is, and I, I will show you that, is it can take lists as well. So if I did a pull array after moving some of this initial geometry, we'll see what happens here. It will take a moment because it has to read. I think this one takes... Oh, about half a minute. So let's just sit here and have a cup of coffee. We're going on about 30 minutes. And I will continue the series. Uh, there it is. It's blown out. It did its polar array. You've got a lot more items that are trying to number. So you might want to take your count. Uh, not populate. You can take your populate count down. Take your polar array.
really got down to see. Otherwise, it actually works pretty nice. It explored a pretty cool geometric building structure, uh, which would be hard to build. But with this pattern, it's basically dissecting and taking apart geometries. Once again, I was trying to get into multiples instead of just singularity. And so that's, that's a really nice one. And now the real power of this is going in and taking something like an object, like anything. So you can import anything, materialize any geometry. And I'm taking this from uh, like Master Car, just a bolt. Put that into your geometry. It immediately reads. It may take a few minutes. Uh, I think it's about 30 seconds, like I said earlier. Maybe 15. And not all of it works as it comes in, as it tries to dissect these strange geometries and meshes, depending on how they're built and how many parts are, uh, are listed. I usually join them. Uh, but I like this little script. I think we're okay. Yeah, I think we're okay. Just that one would run a lot faster. I just have to get in and explode my scripts. Something's happened. My geometry is here. I think my geometry's there. I've internalized it. One closed bracket over here. This geometry is still producing points. There's a breadth problem here. Now, what did I do wrong here? The Boolean intersection is empty. It may be the size of that. I did have problems with this before. I'm going to take this out, plug it back in. I had a little bit of a problem. My breaths are running now. Oh, my Boolean intersection is empty. There it is. It worked. Just had to kind of restart it. And sometimes that's a case of the algorithm saying, what exactly do you want me to do? And I've got a nice read on it now. It's still, there it is, the Boolean. I almost think I'm going to take the whole thing and hit disable and hit enable. And I think that may solve the problem. Sometimes that works. And there we go. And I think I've also... Taking my final objects here. There they are, they're running. It's kind of like redoing your script. So I can bring that from that initial kind of piecemeal jigsaw puzzle bolts. It's kind of awkward how it interpreted that. And there'd be a little bit to clean up. But I really think if you're ending up taking this to some strange explosion uh, through an animation, uh, it's kind of fun to think about that. Kind of blowing itself off in each direction. So I, I really made the script just to show anybody who could model a CAD program. I could within my, my first six to ten scripts make an algorithm that isn't that's very clumsy with a lot of copies. And obviously, Jose Luis Garcia would not be impressed. It's, you know, anytime I'm cutting and pasting, I know there's problems, and I have a couple of problems with the script. But I did like that I was thinking this way, and it started to tell me that I like kind of the four dimensions to what I was doing. So just uh, one other thing as we go into this, I'll save it and I'll hit file open. We'll try the last one, which really is my obsession that I, I started developing for jewelry companies. I just love like scripts and notes that are you know, using six to a dozen. I'm really making component lines. Um, let's go into this always. Let's do a zoom extends all. And you'll see I basically have a spring that uh, not only did have control over the length of that spring, I have control over my numbers are a little huge for what I normally like. Using a little bit of math as a double coil and then a rotated one with multiple strings. So I could actually have like two, so like a double double set of strings rolling through so the script will work a little faster. It's going to have a thickening, which is pretty minor due to the scale. But I have this XYZ kind of uh, what's called the forming tool, which is playing vectors and trying to understand them more. I did not have a really good understanding since grade 12 physics of how to control vectors, but I think getting into robotics and understanding planes, how to direct things and make sure there were collisions, it became absolutely essential. So probably my weakest part starting out in Grasshopper was the vector, uh, figure out vectors and planes and the importance of those. I was much more of a point and line person. But I would say math sets and vectors are where I tend to go. This script is so easy, but still I think it's funny that the multiplication node is seven months old. There's an arc to bend off of. There's a curve. There's a polar array geometry. There's a bend to form node. And these are the ones that usually slow you down in the transformations. People like them a little too much, and they wonder why their script kind of crashes out on them. And the reason it's still moving fast is because that bend to form is really going to slow down when you throw a pipe around and try and think about what's happening when you do that. If you have slow scripts with pipes, I would say go in and try to find if you have a uh, sorry if you have a mesh uh, pipe, and that will allow you uh, a way to grab that geometry, 
choose the number of sides. So we can have six sides to get uh, OK. And then we can grab that. We're going to relay that um, radius down here. You can see that we have a pretty fast moving strip now that we can see the solid geometry. We technically could cap it if we want. I think this is enumerated through a cap system. Oh, this is just Boolean toggle. So you can use one and zero, but you can also use Boolean toggle and cap. And then Oh, but my cap does not like a cap. My cap, the law does not want to do that, so I guess I'll leave it. Let me just take it to bake. I'll figure that out later. And it takes a little bit of time to bake. And now I can leave my grasshopper. I have produced a bent, wiggly little string, and I have had to go into the the, uh, the old style phone cord tutorial from Rhino. It's not too bad. Um, you can see the polylines that are making that a little more speed. See, obviously, you probably wouldn't want to use the mesh pipe, or you could use the subdivision now with Rhino 7, or you could use the variable pipe to really jazz this up. So I'm going to take that and just leave it because there's so many wonderful colors on there to start. Just move this out to this side and save that. So hopefully, you found that interesting. Uh, 36 minutes. That's my first tutorial. I will record it, I will set it off, and we will continue by revisiting my earliest strips next Friday as well.